nice to be with you all this evening and to have you here. Thank you for coming. I love to open God's Word, and I hope that you are blessed and love to do that too. But take a minute to look at the questions that were turned in, and since it reminds me to remind you, that's what the cards are for. I'd love to have you put your name on there. I'm trying to learn your names. I'm not sure old people can ever do that, but I'm going to try. So I put them on the screen because there weren't so many this evening. And uh, I made a mistake. It doesn't matter in a way that I changed from PowerPoint to Keynote about 15, I don't know, 15 years ago. And I never noticed you can make Keynote take a PowerPoint program and turn it into uh, Keynote, but it will mess things up for you. So here's how the page should have looked. Uh, the V and the I were side by side looking strange and some other things, but uh, this is how the name Vicarious Filii Dei uh, adds up to this strange number 666. How many of you noticed the address on this church building out on the street? Did you notice it wasn't 666? It's 777. And seven is God's favorite number. It's used many times in the Bible, especially in the book of Revelation. All right, besides that one, there was a couple of others. Um, did Jesus descend into hell while in the grave? The answer is no, but if you want to look at John 20, 17, it talks about uh, him being with his father uh, after the resurrection and so forth. What does quickened by the Spirit mean? In fact, why don't you turn with me to 1 Peter 3, and let's look at verse 18. First and second and third Peter are right down near Revelation, just before John's three letters, pretty much. And uh, chapter 3, verse 18. Which says, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Many of you know that the word in the King James that's, that's translated from the, the Greek quick means to live uh, or to be made live in the, in the sense of quickened. I really like that translation. Uh, it, it talks about the, uh, the quick in the dead, the living in the dead in one place. Uh, so that's what that means. Uh, quickened by the Spirit, that God raised him up from the dead. Of course, Jesus said, you know, he had the power to raise himself uh, because he is God, and God really did not die. The man died. Now, there's this uh, text that people struggle with. Uh, how did Jesus preach to the spirits? Uh, and so you'll see in verse 19. By which also, that is to say, by the Spirit, he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which were sometimes disobedient when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a pre uh, preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. So what did it mean? Uh, the Bible doesn't just go right up and explain it, but Jesus has existed from eternity and when Moses was preaching and building, the Holy Spirit was upon him as he spoke. And so, in that sense, Jesus uh, was there uh, helping to try to encourage people to take advantage of God's plan to save their lives. If you turn to Romans 6.11, oh, about a quarter of an inch to the left in your Bible in case you're not just sure exactly where that is. This uh, same promise is given unto us. Romans 6.11 says, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus. This is really our topic for this evening. There's a special ceremony that Jesus gave people to symbolize them dying and living again. 
So we'll look at that in some little bit of detail. So that's what quicken means. Let's go to the next one. Uh, Rome destroyed Jesus' physical body. Wasn't it the Jews who condemned him? The answer is yes. In their official body, there were actually seven trials that Jesus went through. But in the Sanhedrin, uh, they asked Jesus if he was the son of God. And he essentially said yes. And so the high priest said, isn't that sufficient reason to kill him? It's unbelievable, folks, but that's uh, the way it happened. So the answer is uh, yes. It's interesting that both Pilate and Herod did not think Jesus was guilty. Isn't that interesting? Very interesting. All right, number five. Does Satan have to get permission in order to torture man? Turn with me to Job. That's uh, way back in the Old Testament, about this far. I missed it by a few pages. There's Job. And let's go to the very first chapter and read a couple of verses. I'm going to give you the context instead of taking the time to read the context. It appears that a representative from every planet in the universe, and I told you one of the nights we were here that in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1, uh, chapter 11, verse 1, I'm sorry, it's, it makes it clear that there are other worlds that, that were created with people. And apparently, there is a representative from each of them that meet with God once in a while. And in this case, because Satan had talked Adam and Eve into sinning, he became, uh, if you will, the representative of the earth instead of Christ. So he's meeting uh, there in heaven, uh, and, he, and God speaks to him. Notice what God said to him here in chapter 2, uh, verse 8. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there's none like him in the earth? A perfect and an upright man. Now that's interesting. Had Job ever done anything wrong? Say yes. But how does God look at him? Perfect, because Job has been forgiven. Amen? Is that good news? God looks at you and he says to somebody, she's a perfect lady. He looks at even me, I can't believe it, and say he's a perfect man because I've been forgiven. Boy, what a, what a precious thing. So this is what God says to Satan. And Satan answers uh, in verse 9. Ah, does Job fear God for nothing? You have made a hedge around him, around his house, and about everything he owns. He's, he's the wealthiest man on the face of the earth. It's an amazing story, uh, all the wealth that he has. And by the way, we think this is the first book that was ever written in, that ended up in the Bible. You have blessed uh, the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. You just put forth your hand now and touch all that he has, and he'll curse you to your face. What does God do? He says, OK, you go ahead. Don't touch him. Do what you want. And it's a horrible story, folks. Uh, one tragedy after another. All his 10 children are killed. Somebody steals all his animals. And, and, and one servant after another comes in with these terrible reports. He was, uh, <laughs> he, he was uh, the wealthiest man in the world, and now he had almost nothing. But it says here that he did not curse God, neither did he sin. In fact, let me just look here. Um, for the right verse. Verse 22, in all this, Job sinned not, nor did he charge God foolishly. I don't know, folks, if I even lost one of my two girls, it seems to me like it would be the most horrible thing that could ever happen. Forget the money, I don't care about that. But he did not charge God foolishly. Isn't that interesting? Have you ever noticed how people swear? Who do they always swear? Whose name do they always swear with? Isn't that strange? I don't know that they even realize what they're doing, taking God's name in vain like that. So um, Satan comes back 
and says in verse, in chapter 2, verse 4, ah, excuse me for, excuse me for, for, for suggesting how uh, uh, stubborn uh, and skeptical Satan was. Skin for skin. Yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. You just put forth your hand, and you touch his bone and flesh, and he'll curse you to your face. And I won't take too much time because of time. Uh, God allows Satan to make Job so miserably sick, he wished he, wished he could die. And again, Job finally says, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Isn't that something? So the, here's the answer I give to people, and I love this. Uh, nothing touches us without God's permission. Are you all with me on that? And in Romans 8, verse 28, it says, All things work together for good to them that love God and are the called according to his purpose. So you and I have a, the privilege of being called to do God's work. Amen? And the, the, the work, really, is to love people. That's, that's, that's the work. I love the way Jesus treated people. I, I got to tell you a story. I shouldn't do this. <clears throat> he and the disciples are walking one day, and here's this blind man. Now, a lot of times people are asking Jesus for something. Every once in a while. There's none of that. Jesus just stops and does something. And in this case, this man has been blind from birth, never been to school, quite likely. And uh, Jesus comes up and makes some mud by spitting on the dirt. And, and apparently, without saying a word to the man, I, I, he's sitting there probably like this. And all of a sudden, he feels a hand on his eye rubbing the mud on his eyes. And uh, after Jesus does that, he says to the man, now go wash the mud off in a pool nearby as a name. So the man did that, and then this is what the Bible says. This is John chapter 10, uh, John chapter 9. I love this. Three words. He came seeing. If I had an hour and a half, I would talk to you about the marvels of the human eye and how for a baby to learn to see, there are trillions of connections that have to be created in the brain and a trillion connections that have to be cut before the baby can fasten its eyes on your eyes and smile. You all know what I'm talking about, don't you? Does it take a while for that to happen? In other words, like learning to talk, you and I all had to learn to see. Got that? But this man, who had never seen the light of day, did not know how to see. Are you all with me on this? But the Bible says, you fill it in after I say the first two words. He came seeing. Boy, that's powerful. And at the end of the book, it strikes me now that I talked to this congregation about this story in January. At the end of the chapter, Jesus turns this man without any education into an eloquent teacher. It's just incredible, folks, what God could do for you and for me if I would let him and cooperate with him. All right, that was free. That was not in the notes. Number six, Jesus denounced all religions, did he not? Well, in a way. I'm not going to take the time right now because they just took some time. Jesus, Jesus taught that there was one truth and that if people had another uh, interpretation or didn't agree with that, they, of course, uh, would not be able to be part of God's kingdom. And... Uh, Here's the last one. By the way, there was a really great question about the millennium, which we will be covering in a night, so I don't want to try to discuss it here. If you have not been baptized before you die, can this be fixed? If you, I'll just tell you what this says here in Hebrews 9.27. Is, as is it appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. 
So I need to uh, respond to God's call, friends, before I die. Is that correct? By the way, do any of us know when we're going to die? Are any of us even guaranteed the next breath? Do you think it would be a good idea to do this now rather than later? At least that's my encouragement for you. So let's begin with our topic this evening, how to successfully bury the past. One night in John chapter 3, a very prominent Jewish leader, a member of the Sanhedrin, the highest authoritative body in the Jewish nation, came to Jesus at night. The Bible does not say this, but probably he didn't want anybody to know that he was interested in talking to Jesus. So he finds Jesus at night. The Bible doesn't say just where that was. And he asks him an interesting question. Nicodemus, the ruler, came to Jesus, quote, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou dost, except God be with him. I don't know why Nicodemus opened with this. Uh, I don't know if it was flattery or he was just trying to find some way to have a conversation. But Jesus got right to the point. He said, truly, truly, that's what verily, verily means. I say to you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So whatever Nicodemus had in his mind, Jesus just bypassed the whole thing and got right to the heart of the matter. Would you agree with that? to be born again. Now, in America today, that has become a very common phrase. So most people are, even if they couldn't define it real well, familiar with the idea. But uh, Nicodemus said, how can a man be born again? Does he get in his mother's womb again or something? Jesus said, truly I say unto you, except a man is born of water, and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Born of water is speaking of being baptized. And born of the Spirit, which we're going to look at a fair amount here for a few minutes, is a complete change. We point to the heart. It's really occurring up here. Do you know that it was, uh, I can't give you the date, but hundreds of years went by in human history before people realized that you think here instead of here. You, you can't feel that you're thinking here, can you? People just didn't know that. And uh, <laughs> when Neva and I first held hands, uh, I felt something besides her hand. Where did I feel this thing? right about in here somewhere, is that right? So all of us are familiar with the idea that the, the metaphor of the heart is used to refer to what is taking place in our minds. So to be born of the spirit is this change, and just, he, he discusses it a little bit more, that only God can make. And folks, this is so critical. I, I think most of you have a fair idea of this. Maybe most of you, maybe all of you have had this experience. But it's a sobering question. Have I allowed God to make that transformation as though I was being resurrected uh, in my life, in my mind, and in my life? Then Jesus goes on. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. But, and I would rather use but than and there, but that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto you, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it happens to go, and you hear it. He, he, Jesus didn't say this, but you can sometimes see its effect on the leaves or something. But you can't tell where it came from or where it's going. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. In other words, Jesus was using the wind to illustrate that you can't, you can't see the wind. You can only see its effect. Is that correct? 
And he says the, the uh, regeneration, if you want to use that word, that the Spirit wants to do in your life is the same way. You can't see the Spirit, but you can see its effect. Most of you know what I'm talking about. When somebody comes to know Christ, they could have been a mean-spirited problem person, but it changes them entirely. There's a lot of wonderful stories. Uh, some of them pop into my mind, uh, but uh, most of you have seen that, and I hope it's obvious to every one of us here what Jesus is talking about. The Holy Spirit has the ability to change. You know, folks, probably everyone in this room at some time in their life has gotten angry at somebody. Say amen. And you shouldn't have, let's say. And maybe in the midst of that, you said, oh, Lord, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. And do you know what? The Lord can take Take that anger away in a second because you ask. Is that beautiful? And he wants that kind of a prayer, if you will, constantly. You remember what I told you was always back here in my mind? You remember that? Didn't I tell you that? I was studying advanced differential equations. Didn't I tell you that? What was, in spite of how hard that was, what was floating around back here? Huh? Neva was. You remember that? I couldn't get her off my mind. I didn't want to get her off my mind. That's what it's supposed to be with the Lord, friends. No matter what I'm doing, no matter how hard I'm having to think and, 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 and understand something, it's always there. And folks, the only way to make that happen is to be in rather constant communion with him. I couldn't wait every day to get on the phone and talk to Neva. This was before cell phones, you understand. This was 100 years ago. <clears throat> yeah, I must be old. But all teasing aside, folks, this is the plan. And God has a plan that when you study the word of God, it helps foster that. You know, you can read trash. You know what I'm talking about? Might be fascinating, might be gripping, but it's just trash. And actually, it's probably bad for you. I shouldn't say that. It is bad for you. Um, but when you read God's word, friends, the Holy Spirit is there speaking to your heart, to mine, and asking for entrance. Isn't that beautiful? That's the plan. And then speaking to God. Um, I have formed the habit through the years. We own 40 acres up in northeastern Washington. It's a ranch. The work there is endless. How many have ever worked on a ranch and know what I'm talking about? Some of you have a ranch that's one acre, and the, and the work is endless. I, I get up, and I just work all day long. But I've learned and I don't always practice this as much as I want. I just talk to him all the time. I ask him to help me. I thank him. I say, please, Lord, help me. Help me to be efficient. And when I'm on top of the roof putting on some roofing and the hammer falls clear to the floor, I want to get upset. Do you understand that? But I've learned to say, oh, Lord, I didn't want that, but OK, I know what you're doing. What is he doing? He's trying to teach me that whatever happens, he wants me to be kind and patient. That doesn't mean that Jesus never spoke strongly against sin. He did that. But I think when he pronounced the woes on the Pharisees, that there were tears in his voice. Did he love those people? He, he said, you guys are like a bunch of snakes. You're like, you're like, a, you're like a coffin that's been painted white. In other words, you're just dead inside. He didn't, he didn't say that to be mean, friends. He was saying that because he loved them. And you know what I love? In Acts chapter 6, verse 7, 
after Jesus was crucified and resurrected. I love this. This is one of the greatest texts in all the Bible because the priests were his enemies. And what it says there, this is fabulous. A great, this is the exact wording, a great company of priests became obedient to the faith. Is that beautiful? Oh. God wants to use me and you like that, friends. He wants to, you, you think, that you have to have, I mean, you might be tempted to think that you have to have prowess and, 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 and maybe you can't explain things very well. Folks, that's nothing to God. He can, he can make you eloquent with his word. Amen? Amen. That was all not in the notes either. I got to get going here. All right. So there's these three essential requirements, and I want to show you something interesting. Here's a text. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. What did I tell you about finding truth? What was one of the great principles about finding truth in the Bible? To read everything in the whole Bible about that topic. For example, you could also read in Mark. In, uh, so here the, here's the two things here believing and, and baptized. Uh, you could also read in uh, Mark 16, if you will confess in your mouth, you know, confess that Jesus is Lord, if you wish, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you can be saved. That's a mistake. It, that is, I don't think that's Mark 16. That is Hebrews 10, uh, 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 um, John 10, verse 9. I don't know how I got 16, 16 there. But anyway, that's the text. My point is, folks, that's a little different than the other one. Are you all with me on this? So be a little careful about just taking one verse and saying that's the whole truth. It may be much more encompassing than that. Are you all with me on that? And there is an area that most Protestant churches have turned away from because they just want to read one verse like this. And I want to deal with that with you a little bit this evening and then some more later on. Confessing. Now, these are beautiful things, folks. Don't misunderstand me. But what I'm going to tell you is that uh, that's not all. Turn with me, if you would. I wanted you to see this in your Bible. In fact, I would really like to have you underline it if you brought your pen. James 1, uh, 23 and 2, 24. Peter, let's see, James is right after the book of Hebrews, if you can find that, which is after a few others. First chapter of James, verse 23, isn't it? Yeah. Here's what it says. For if any, I'm going to say if any one, be a hearer of the word, but not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his face his natural face in a glass. He looks in the mirror, that's what's going on there, and forgets what manner of person he was. Um, what was I doing one day? And I didn't realize when I got home there was a bunch of black suit all over, um, suit, yeah, all over my face. I can't remember if it was you, sweetheart, or somebody else said, have you looked in the mirror? <laughs> <laughs> and this is a spiritual looking, isn't it? He, he sees that there's something wrong in his life, and he just goes on and doesn't even worry about it. So what I'm talking about here, folks, this is very difficult for most Protestant churches, and those of you, many of you in here are in that category. The Protestant world tends to teach you are saved by faith alone. And what that has done for the Protestant churches, it's, it has uh, made them believe that it doesn't matter uh, very much how they live as long as they believe. Uh, they're saved by grace. And my church is criticized for, being, for, for saying, you have to earn your way to heaven by works. I don't believe that. I believe you and I are saved by grace. But folks, it's throughout the Bible. 
God wants us to obey. And I have many precious friends. I never, I never say things to them unless they ask questions. And um, you may not agree with that, but uh, that's kind of what I try to do too. And Lord, the Lord has blessed that. I, I'll, I'll tell you a story later that connects with that. Uh, turn with me to John 14, 15. It's a bunch of pages to the left. The fourth gospel, chapter 14, and verse 15. If ye love me, Jesus says, keep my commandments. And I have that verse circled. Turn with me to Romans 6. That's off to the right again, about that many pages. Um, Acts and Romans, uh, verse, uh, chapter 6 and verse 12. I'm just giving you several examples. Tell me when you're there. Say amen. Okay. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it, that is to obey sin, through the lust. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but yield yourselves unto God. So, friends, is there a call here to obey God? Yes. And uh, I presented a lecture here last Saturday that I'm going to summarize in one sentence. The reason it is not legalism for God to require obedience do you know what I mean by that? Everybody? You're not nodding, so I'm going to try to explain it. Legalism, by definition, says you have to keep the law in order to be saved. That's legalism. The reason it is not legalism for God to require obedience is because when you and I are connected, please follow this, when you and I are connected with him, which happens when I choose to let him have control of my life, and I believe in him, and so forth. When you and I are connected with him, it becomes his power that's doing the obedience and not my own. That's why it's not legalism. All through the Bible, that it requires obedience, folks, if you're going to be in God's kingdom. Are you all with me on that? That is a beautiful truth, wouldn't you agree? Jesus did the same thing. Listen, folks. Every miracle he performed was not with his own godly power. It was with his Father's power. He said, I can of mine own self do what? Nothing. It's an amazing story, folks. Now, to the casual observer, in fact, even to you as the observer, it will feel like you're doing it, but because you're connected with Christ, it's his power by faith and not your own. Got that? Do you think that's beautiful? I think it's beautiful. So all through the Bible, um, you'll see this. And I'm just going to be real transparent with you. This is not in the notes. This is terrible what I'm doing all night long here. <clears throat> and I'll tell you some stories later this week. When I was a young pastor, I wanted to join the local ministerial association. That's a group, in this case, of 60 pastors in Billings, Montana, uh, all of them evangelical types. There was another uh, ministerial association that had the more liberal, uh, progressive churches, if you will. And uh, I signed a paper that said, I believe, in order to join, I believe that I'm saved by grace alone, through faith in Jesus Christ, and not of works, lest any man should boast. That's Ephesians chapter 2. And uh, I won't tell you the long part of this story, but the uh, membership committee thought that I was lying when I signed that. They thought that Adventists thought that they got to heaven because they obeyed. Are you all with me on this? So they called me before the executive committee nine or 10, 12 men, 
uh, it was a very interesting uh, discussion. It began to ply me with pretty hard questions. You believe this, don't you? You believe that, don't you? And, um, but after about an hour and a half, they said, well, OK, that's enough. We'll let you know what we think. And they uh, sent me a letter saying, we will let you be in the association, but not your church, which was kind of funny. Churches don't join ministerial associations. Ministers do, not churches. I didn't say a word. And there's no credit to me, folks, but by God's grace, he made me friends with those people. In fact, I felt like my responsibility was that I needed to be a pastor for these men. So I started visiting them. Uh, and a lot of those men, I got paid f to be a full-time worker, pastor. A lot of those men had a, had a five-day-a-week uh, a job in addition to pastoring their church. I learned to love those men. I tell you, I learned to love those men. And uh, they actually, can, can you believe this? You're going to fall out of your chair. They made me the vice president of the organization. Who was responsible for all of that, friends? The Lord Jesus Christ. Don't you think that I'm anything but faulty? That's what I am. But in spite of that, the Lord will use you, folks. You, you can get awfully discouraged with yourself when you make some bad mistakes. Is that correct? You need to get on your knees, of course. You don't have to. You can just say it. But it's really special to be on your knees and say, Lord, I'm so sorry. And he will make you folks as white as snow. Is that correct? All right. I won't even look at the rest of these verses. But it's all through the Bible, folks, all through the New Testament. In fact, in Revelation 22, you're rewarded according to your works. Woo! That sounds like legalism. No, 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 no. Because it's Christ's power in you. Are you all with me on that? I'm repeating myself. OK, let's keep going. What about the thief on the cross who wasn't baptized? I love that story. Those two guys were probably murderers and thieves, and they deserve what they're getting. And here is the king of the universe. And one of the thieves is cursing Jesus. And the other thief was kind of doing that too. But as he hung there and observed Jesus Christ, folks, this is beautiful. As he observed Jesus Christ, Christ won his heart. And he starts scolding the other thief. And he says, hey, man, you and I are here for what we did. This man is innocent. How did that thief know that? He didn't know, I don't think, about Christ. He could tell by what Christ was saying, couldn't he? And I think the Holy Spirit was revealing that to him as well. And finally, this thief says, um, um, I thought I had that text, so I'll just tell you you're familiar with it. He's, he, oh, it comes a little later. He finally says, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And then I'll show you the rest of that text as we get to it. All right. How many different kinds of baptism there are? The Bible says there's only one kind. And uh, what does this born again uh, and baptism mean? This is Jesus' explanation. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ, it's an interesting phrase, baptized into, but that's the phrase he uses, were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Do you get the metaphor? When you're baptized, and you mostly know this, I'm going to show you a few texts on it, under the water, it's like you're being buried. Now, it's probably a good thing we don't baptize people in the dirt and cover them up with dirt and then get them out of there. They might not survive. <laughs> so so the, 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 the Lord wanted to use water to represent that it's like the old man, the old woman is dying. And when you come up out of the water, the new woman, the new man, has been resurrected as a miracle. 
That's the symbolism of this thing that the Bible talks about extensively. Death to the old sinful way, burial of the sins, if you will, and a resurrection. This is a picture that somebody drew of Jesus' resurrection. And there's Mary uh, waiting for Jesus to resurrect her brother. We'll talk about that too briefly. Now, John the Baptist was a cousin of Jesus. It was a, actually, the Bible says that uh, Jesus' mother Mary and John's mother Elizabeth were cousins. Elizabeth was technically her aunt, but you could think of it as a cousin. And uh, Elizabeth was an old woman. She had been barren. She couldn't have a child. And for Jewish people, that was a very big deal. You probably are aware of that if you do much reading in the Bible. And there was this miracle that took place. I'd love to tell the story. But anyway, she becomes pregnant. And she is going to give birth to John the Baptist. And the Bible talks about this. God is purposely raising up this man whose name was going to be John to be a spirit-filled uh, exponent, a preacher to the world. And he became known as John the Baptist because he was telling everybody they should be baptized. And... Uh, Elizabeth was about six or eight months along when Mary got pregnant, and when she was just, we don't know exactly, she was partway through the pregnancy, she leaves, she leaves Nazareth, where they lived, to go visit her aunt uh, Elizabeth. And I just love this story. <laughs> when, when, when Mary comes walking into the room, the Bible says that Elizabeth's baby leapt for joy. <laughs> Isn't that cool? That little baby boy who was going to be a herald of the gospel. Somehow the Holy Spirit was already working on him. And when the Savior came in the room as a baby, he shouted and jumped. Well, I don't know if he could shout, but he jumped. So here's John out there preaching. And it says, then went out to him everybody, Jerusalem, Judea, Everywhere, people went out to hear this man preach. Very interesting. Big crowds. And because he was filled with the Holy Ghost, filled with the Holy Spirit, people's hearts were moved. And he told them they should be baptized. And he baptized these people out there. And the reason I'm including this story, the problem is that sometimes some churches don't even tell their people they should be baptized. And one of the problems that came from pagan Rome is baptism by sprinkling which, folks, is not biblical. The Bible calls, using the word, the Greek word is baptizo, which means to put clear under. And you say, well, it's just a symbol. What does it matter? Well, uh, you can argue that. I think the safest thing is to recognize what the symbol is. The symbol can actually be very powerful, folks. I have baptized many, many people through the years. And people often come up weeping. Why are they weeping? Weeping for joy because they, they just can sense the, what God has done in them. And he's forgiven them besides that. So it's a powerful symbol. And we're called to do this. And John was John the Baptist. He was the baptizer. And we're baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. There's the river. John was also baptizing near Anon. There was a lot of water there. And uh, Jesus comes to him, and Jesus wants John to baptize him. John had never seen Jesus before. This is an amazing story. The Holy Spirit helped John suddenly recognize it. And in the middle of his talk, he stopped and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. First time he ever saw Jesus. And, of course, he, that was just came to him from the Holy Spirit. And Jesus comes to him and says, I want you to baptize me. And John says, I'm not even worthy to undo your shoelaces. And you don't know this, folks, probably. You haven't thought about it. But in the East, this is not the case in America in the West. In the East, the foot is about the dirtiest thing there is. Do you remember when that Bradley vehicle drove up to Hussein's statue? What is this, 30 years ago? And... Uh, the U.S. and some Iraqi people climbed up there 
uh, what did one Iraqi man do to Sodom's face? He took off his shoe and slapped his face. That was the most, thank you, the most insulting thing you can do for somebody in the East. In fact, if you're sitting somebody across the room and you cross your legs and they can see the bottom of your foot, that's an insult. Very interesting. Uh, so this is, this, and John, John says, I'm not, even, I'm not even worthy to undo your shoelace. And Jesus said, suffer it to be so now. Because God has ordained this. And so John baptized Jesus. And when Jesus came up out of the water, um, it says, lo, the heavens were opened. I'm reading in the middle. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Who was speaking? His father. Beautiful. Now there's another story to illustrate baptism. This Ethiopian eunuch was the treasurer of Ethiopia. This guy was like right under the queen or the king. He had been to Jerusalem. The Bible doesn't say this. I think he went there to buy the book of Isaiah. At that time, you could not buy a Bible. You buy a scroll, which was handwritten. Very expensive. Nobody could afford this. You go to church, and there was a scroll there, and that was all. You, you, you had to have the Bible read to you. But this guy was the treasure. He had access to money. Now, the Bible doesn't say this, but I think this is what happened. And he's on his way back, and his driver is driving the chariot, and uh, he's got the scroll open. And by chance, I'm sorry, I think it was just the book of Isaiah. Nobody could buy a scroll that was the whole Bible. It would have been, it would have been the size of a piano or more, see. So he's got this open, and he's, he's, he's reading in chapter 53. And most of you know that this is about the Messiah. And uh, the uh, story there about how the Messiah is being treated and so forth is very precious uh, in terms of the Christian faith. But uh, uh, Philip is somewhere way off, and, and the Holy Spirit says to Philip, get out there in the desert. And when he gets there, he sees this Ethiopian eunuch. And uh, Philip runs up and catches up with the chariot, and he hears the man reading out of the book of Isaiah. And uh, <clears throat> he says to him, uh, do you understand what you're reading? He's, he's going along like this. Do you understand what you're reading? I can imagine. <laughs> and uh, what did the man say? How can I accept, let me put it up there, how can I accept some should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come and sit with him. There's a story here besides what's going to happen in terms of a baptism, folks. The story here is that when you become connected with Christ, he is interested, folks, in you influencing everybody you come near. Even without your saying a word, because the Holy Spirit is upon you, or if you will, in you, people are influenced by that. They're influenced by the look of your face. Uh, the one reason I don't, uh, among the reasons I don't like a mask is it took away my ability to walk through a store and smile at somebody and start a conversation. For me, it was a religious problem. But I won't go any more there, although I'd like to. Um, I'm a scientist. I could, I could keep you here for five hours talking to you about the science of this disease. But in any case, and, and its cure. Now, I shouldn't have done even that. But uh, <clears throat> I'll tell you this. <laughs> December 8 of last year, there was a hearing in the Senate. Five physicians were there to testify. The leading one, I've listened to all of them. They're all just first-class people. Dr. Pierre Corey said on December 8, starting today, 
there doesn't need to be another single death from COVID-19 because of this drug called ivermectin that will absolutely keep people from getting sick if it's used prophylactically, or if they get sick and use it, they will not die. You don't seem very impressed. Anyway, I shouldn't have done that, but I did it. Okay. So for your interest, my wife and I take ivermectin, which has been shown to keep people from getting sick. So I'm comfortable not wearing a mask because we're taking it prophylactically. Do you know what I'm talking about? And uh, it's a drug that's been around for 70 years. It got the Nobel Prize. I heard another physician, his name is, is um, Ray Cole, C-O-L-E, from Idaho, a pathologist. He's treated over almost, a, did he say 700,000 patients? And uh, he is an expert in this field. And he said there is not a drug on the face of the earth that's any safer than ivermectin. And so anyway. Uh, that was not in the notes. Philip sits with him. And um, this is the artist's drawing. And, he, and he's reading. He was in, in Isaiah 53. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter and like a lamb dumb before his shear, so he opened not his mouth. And uh, the eunuch said, who's this man speaking about, himself or somebody else? And then I love this. And Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and did what? He preached unto him Jesus. And apparently, he taught him what Jesus taught. Because as they travel along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, here, some water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he ordered the chariot to be stopped. And uh, Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you can. And he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down. Now, the, the reason I'm using this story is for several reasons, but in case somebody thinks that a sprinkling would be satisfactory, the Bible completely talks, folks, about an immersion under the water. Are you all with me? That's the purpose of this story. What did they do? What did they go down into? The water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him, and uh, when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord Choom, took Philip away. What do you suppose that man got home that night and said to his wife? You won't believe what I'm going to tell you, <laughs> right? But listen, folks, it, it may well be. It may well be. Yeah. I'm sorry. To his mother or his sister. Hey, just because you're a eunuch doesn't mean you can't marry. You couldn't procreate, but you might want to marry. Now I lost my train of thought. <laughs> he, goes, he goes home to his uh, whoever. <laughs> but anyway, the point is this, folks. It may be that God won't use me or you in such a dramatic way, but he wants, you to, he wants to use you every day. I love this passage in Isaiah, in Isaiah 50, verse 4. Let me quote it to you. The Lord has given me the tongue of the learned that I might know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakeneth me morning by morning. He wakeneth mine ear to hear as the learned. In other words, God wants to teach me early in the day to be thinking about him, to be connected with him. And he wants me to watch for opportunities to be kind to somebody. Speak a word in season. You go back and read this passage, if you will. Keep it in mind. Isaiah 50 and verse 4. This is Jesus' own prayer. It's obvious if you read it. Jesus was awakened morning by morning, and his father taught him how to speak a word in season. It's beautiful. And God wants that for me and for you. All right. Um, this is the task for you and me. We're, we're to help people come to know Jesus Christ. Notice this, to observe everything that I have commanded. It's another indication, folks, that it's not just believing, but it's doing. Are you all with me? 
but the doing is supposed to be God's power and not my own. Now, what I talked about last Saturday was this. Can an evil man do something good in his own power? Say yes. Is there some benefit? Yes, possibly. Is that what God has in mind? No. He wants it to be his presence so that it's actually his power. It may feel like it's yours, but by faith, it's his. That's the idea. Beautiful plan, folks, a beautiful plan. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not will not. Peter said, repent, every one of you, and receive the Holy Ghost. Can a baby do all of this? This is actually my first granddaughter. But uh, the Bible actually teaches, I'll put, this, I'll put the text up in a minute, that people are supposed to be instructed. Jesus said, this is Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. What's the next word? Baptizing them and teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Is that correct? That's the plan. So is it possible, folks, for me to get into not listening like I should, and I get busy, and I get up, and I don't pray, and I don't talk to him, and I'm out there doing good things on my own. Is that possible? Yeah. That's not what God wants. And uh, that's why he let me drop the hammer. He's keeping re he keeps reminding me that I need him. Amen? So every trial, every trial, friends, that God allows to come, and he doesn't allow anything to come. I mean, everything that comes, it's, it's, he's allowing it. Every trial is designed to be a blessing in some way. Sometimes, folks, a trial that you have will help you relate to somebody else that you never could have had you not had that trial. Does that make sense? There's always a purpose, no matter how horrible the situation is, in God's plan, in working in my life and in yours. I'm going to quickly go through these. There's a couple of things I want to do in closing. Just some examples that anciently uh, there were baptistries where immersion, if you will, was used. Here's the Leaning Tower piece that we've been there. There's a baptistry in there. It's not a sprinkling place. It's a, it's a baptistry. Uh, this one is hidden in a mountain cave. Uh, but it's a baptistry where apparently in order to avoid punishment, people were using that. Me and and I have been in many Russia, churches in Russia, and uh, not all of them, but they used to have uh, baptistries. There's actually a painting of Jesus supposedly being baptized under the water. Uh, this idea of sprinkling came around the 12th century, 14th century, uh, and as I said, it's not just a symbol. It's a beautiful symbol, powerful symbol. And uh, there's other scriptures that des describe this, but you take what the whole Bible says. Buried with him in baptism, we then are risen with him uh, in God's power. So my problems are over once I get baptized, right? I shouldn't tell you this story. Would you give me an extra 15 minutes tonight? Could you stand that? I was in a church in Seattle for a month holding meetings like this, and we had a baptism with a number of people. And um, it just happened, for some, whatever reason I don't recall, I was leading the music between people getting baptized. The congregation would sing a verse, and the next person would be ready, and the pastor would baptize that person, and so forth. And I was actually leading the music. I'm a musician of sorts. And uh, an elder came walking down the side of the church and came up and whispered in my ear, the couple that had just been baptized, he said, their house is on fire. I, I turned to him and I said, get the pastor, you can't get the pastor, he's baptized. I said, get another elder with you, take them out into the lobby. They're sitting right over there. They just sat down, her hair was wet, she just sat down over there and tell them what happened. Who do you think set that fire? Satan did. Did God allow it? Yes. I, 
hope nobody's house burns down after your baptism. But I'm, you, you get the point, don't you, folks? The devil hates it if you haven't been baptized. And I'm, I mean, I'm going to appeal to you tonight on your card if you've never been baptized and, and the Lord has spoken to your heart this evening or maybe you've thought about it before. Put your name on there and put the word baptism under your name and circle the word baptism. Will you do that? Give some thought to that if you haven't been baptized. And, uh, but whatever trial comes to you, God will use it as a blessing and see you through it. Um, there has no temptation taken you, but such is common to man, and God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above what you're able. God will not allow anything, folks, to come to you that he cannot help you walk through it. And then, do you suppose those two people, after that awful, we went, to the, we went by the house after the thing was all over, and it was just virtually burned to the ground. Do you suppose, as they remained faithful, that they learned that they could trust God no matter what and had quite a testimony about that. Yeah, amen. Amen. Yeah. But don't be frightened, folks. Uh, that's a rare event. But whatever God allows, he allows. He will make a way to escape. I love this. This is one of the great verses in all the Bible, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. He'll make a way of escape that you can bear this problem that he has allowed to come. Somebody always asks, well, I was baptized once, uh, and maybe that's just fine. But a lot of times, when, as people learn new truth, they feel like, I want to be rebaptized. And actually, there's an example of that in the Bible. Uh, it's in Acts chapter 19. I won't read it to you, but that's what it tells about. These people were baptized by one of the apostles, but they hadn't heard of the Holy Ghost. And so... Uh, they, 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 uh, we have not so much as heard whether there was a Holy Ghost. So he said to them, well, who were you baptized? Well, it was John's baptism. Well, that was pretty good, wasn't it? But somehow, because they hadn't heard of the Holy Ghost, uh, Paul said, uh, uh, you should believe on him which should come after him, that is Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of Jesus, which is what the Bible says. When the pastor... Uh, prays, usually this is the way it's done, he prays over the person that's going to be baptized, and uh, he says, I baptize you because the Bible says this, in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, Jesus, and in the name of the Holy Ghost, amen, and then he lays them briefly under the water. <clears throat> so the steps are repentance, a belief, and then instruction, Jesus said, teaching them to observe all things, whatever I've commanded you. A lot of people, I shouldn't say, once in a while somebody says, well, I, I want to be baptized, but I don't want to be involved with any church anywhere. This, this is not what God's plan is, folks. God's plan is that you become part of a body of people who are encouraging one another and working together to accomplish his work on the earth. Are you all with me on this? And the, and the Bible teaches this very plainly. The Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved baptized there in the middle, baptized into a body. And, 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 of course, Christ, in a way, is the body that we are baptized into. And, of course, he said that. He was wounded for our transgressions. This is what the eunuch was reading. And with his stripes, we are healed. It's an interesting metaphor how his death has done that for us. Now, what I wanted to close with is the story of the covenants. I'm going to put the scriptures on the screen, and then I want you to look them up with me if you would. I'll tell you what's behind this, friends. Let me make it clear. Many, Protest many Protestant friends of mine believe that the Ten Commandments were done away with. And then Jesus reinstated nine of them. It's a strange teaching. Uh, and I'll be transparent with you about this. It has to do with Sabbath sacredness, that the seventh day of the week. And for some reason, the devil hates the Sabbath. It's such a, it's a little bit like baptism. It's this symbol of rest. And in a way, folks, when God works through you to help you do right, it's a type of rest. Does that make sense? 
fact, that was kind of my topic Saturday, the true rest. And the devil hates that. And so he has helped the Protestant churches drum up all kinds of ideas as to why you shouldn't keep the seventh day, like the Bible says, like the fourth commandment says. They say, oh, well, that was Jewish. Uh, that's not the case, and I'll discuss that with you later. Uh, but the devil hates it. And, and let me tell you something interesting. You remember this group of pastors that I joined their group? So I'm visiting them from time to time. And one day, I'm visiting one of them. Uh, this guy was just overloaded. They were building, and he just was having so much on his plate. I, I just went there one day, and I said, uh, I'm going to say his first name, Ken. I, I, I came here to just pray with you. I, I know how much, I have an idea how much you're struggling. And uh, we fell into conversation after we prayed. And I never bring these things up. I just don't do that. But somehow he brought it up to me, and he said, you know, Jim, uh, he'd been reading Isaiah 66. And he said, uh, I believe that when we get to heaven, we're going to keep the Sabbath. Because that's what it says. From one month to another and from one week to another, we're going to keep the Sabbath. It says that right in Isaiah 66. And I didn't bring it up. He, he, he brought it up. And then he said to me, you know what, Jim? He says, referring now to the 60 men, he says, we all know that Saturday's the Sabbath. And uh, the devil hates it because... Uh, God intended, folks, to, for there to be a special blessing, you see, in that situation. And here's the reason, the reason I'm mentioning this in terms of the covenants. In the Old Testament, it calls the Ten Commandments the covenant. Now, a covenant is this agreement between two people or between two parties. And God's covenant with the Israelites were, if you will do what I tell you, you'll be my people. Actually, there were two books. There was the tables of stone with the Ten Commandments. Y'all, you're with me on that. And then there was a book that Moses wrote with hundreds of rules about all kinds of daily life stuff. And both of those, uh, God said to Moses, read this to the people and tell them that if they will do these things, I will bless them. And they're not unreasonable. Uh, it, you know what? When it says, thou shalt not commit adultery, which is what, the seventh commandment? Is that a burden or is that a good idea? That's a very good idea, isn't it? They're all like that, folks. They're not a burden. They're reminding us of how, uh, how what a blessing it is to do what God says to do, right? I shouldn't tell you this, but I'm going to. Uh, the chance of Neva getting uh, cervical cancer is zero. Did you know that cervical cancer is a, is a sexually transmitted disease, period? Did you know that? Neva and I were both celibate till we were married, and we have been faithful to each other for 55 years. She doesn't need to get a pap smear. She got one one time, way, way back, because uh, we have been faithful. Are you all with me on this, friends? These, these commandments are really good ideas, including keeping a day holy. It's a blessing, folks, to forget all the stuff that's a problem for you all the time and just spend the day reading, and fellowshipping, and so on. You all with me on this? Do you know that Sunday, for many years, was believed to be a day of rest, and, and, and churches actually, actually kept Sunday? That's virtually all gone all gone, because it was never the truth. Are you all with me on that? The Bible does not teach Sunday sacredness. It came from paganism. Sunday. It's the day for worshiping the sun. That's where it got its name, from paganism. So on. All right. So the idea is that, uh, did you get to Exodus 34 yet? Let's quickly go there. Real easy to find the second book in the Bible, 34. Verse 28. 
And he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights and did neither eat bread nor drink water. And he wrote upon the words, the tables, the words of what? And what were the words? The Ten Commandments. Now, you understand, I think, probably all of you have heard of this, of this thing we call the Old Covenant, right? Turn to Hebrews chapter 8. I don't even know if that's the next one on there. No, let's start in Jeremiah 31. There's a good reason for that. Uh, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, a little one, and then Ezekiel. 31, and I think it's verse 33. <clears throat> oh, it's verse 31, 233. Okay. <clears throat> Are you all there? Behold, the days come, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, which covenant they broke, even though I was a husband to them. But this is the covenant I will make with them. I will put my law where? Well, it says inward parts and in their hearts. Now, follow me, folks. What law is this? It is still the Ten Commandments, which they broke. Those Ten Commandments were written on what? And now God says, I'm going to write it on your heart. Notice what testament I'm in reading this covenant. This is the Old Testament. It has come to be known as the New Covenant. It wasn't new at all, folks. When God wrote it on the stone, he wanted the people to understand that he would write it on their hearts. Does that make sense? Sure. But they didn't get it, and you and I, we've made mistakes. Let's not blame those poor Israelites for the stupid things they did. Now turn to uh, uh, Hebrews 8. I'll show you where it is. It's down about this far right there. Got it? If you're having a hard time finding it. Verse 6. But now he hath obtained a more excellent ministry. This is Jesus. By how much also he is the mediator of a what? A better covenant which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant, folks, that's the one that God made with the Israelites when he wrote them on stone. Are you all with me? If that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. Now, notice carefully where the fault was. Verse 8, for finding fault with who? Was the fault with the writing of the commandments on stone? Was there something wrong with those commandments? Were they faulty? No. The problem was with, with, was with the people. They were at fault. And so he says, what I'm going to do now, instead of putting this on stone, I'm going to write them on your heart. Now, folks, it was his desire to write it on their heart from the start. I'm repeating myself a little bit. But they were so steeped in paganism. They'd been slaves for 400 years. No Bible, no teaching, nothing. So they, 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 they weren't even ready to hear this. Are you all with me on that idea? But now he's saying, even back in Jeremiah's day, uh, he's saying, what I want to do, I'll, I'll put this on your heart. And of course, that's a metaphor, folks, for saying, I'll just make this so you love it. So the new covenant, in a way, isn't new at all. It's just that God has, has gotten to a place where he's able to say to people, and they can understand it, I'm going to write it on your heart. So the Ten Commandments were not done away with. Are you all with me on this, folks? You get, the, you get the point here that the New Covenant is about the Ten Commandments being written here. And that's a metaphor for meaning, I'll love it, I'll understand it, I'll allow God to help me do those things, and from time to time when I fail, and I say, I'm sorry, Lord. He just loves to forgive me. Amen? Let's pray. We love you, Father. We love you, Jesus. We thank you, Holy Spirit, because you're the source 
uh, that lives in us and gives us power. I pray that you'd bless this congregation. And Lord, uh, you know, I don't know, if there's someone here that you've been speaking to that realizes that baptism would be a real blessing and sometime in the near future we could arrange that. So bless them. Bless us all, Lord. Thank you for your wonderful love in Jesus' name.